right now. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Leah Martino, and I'm the Assistant Programming Manager at the uh, Poetry Matters Project. I have the pleasure and excitement to introduce Louisiana's Poet Laureate, Dr. Mona Lisa Saloy, who's the author of Red Beans and Rice Are Yours, the 2005 winner of the T.S. Eliot Prize, scholar and educator at Dillard, Dillard University. Um, so basically today, I just have a couple of questions for you to introduce yourself and your work to the Poetry Matters community. So do you just want to jump I'm in? I'm Mona Lisa. I'm born and raised in New Orleans. So my footprints, my DNA, my family is here, although some of us are spread out. But this is twofold. One, my introduction to Black Creole culture and my oral storytelling, which comes very naturally. My papa was born enslaved in Alabama and walked to New Orleans to be free. I heard that all my life. But I had to attend college as an undergraduate to learn that Indeed, the stories he was telling were passed on by word of mouth, face to face, generation to generation, which is indeed the definition of folklore. Mm -hmm. And those stories are so much a part of me. And his, and he was a Baptist minister. <laughs> so he was quite the speaker. Although illiterate, he knew the Bible by heart. And he, was by trade, he was a bricklayer and cement finisher, which he taught to his sons. And they then became craftsmen and did so many places from the French quarters through the seventh ward, places such as schools and churches and social and pleasure club buildings and other places. But, and the women in my family sewed, they sewed tropical seersucker suits so I learned how to sew very young and actually sewed my way through my first degree. I would say the first two, because by the time I got to the second one, I was making all my clothes. I mean, I'd been doing that anyway, but I was doing other things. I was doing writing. So, but in the beginning, I was sewing for a living. I even did boy bands and the Globetrotters, some of the Globetrotters and some of the NBA and the NFL and the Seattle Supersonics, some of them. And so I was never a great designer, but I could sew anything. <laughs> I could fit anybody. So the other side is my academic side that I literally, my sister made me go to college, I say. She didn't get to finish and saw that as a possibility for me because I was a good student, but my dad didn't want me to go to college because he thought all I needed to do was get married and have kids and the man would take care of me. And that I would probably sew on the side or something the way my mother did. But the interesting thing is that I married too young, married the wrong person. And six months after we were married, I had a car accident. We had a car accident. I broke my pelvis in half, had a hole in my lung, lost my memory for a couple of years. I had a bad concussion. By the grace of God, I came out of it. I, I walk, I run, I, well, no running anymore, but I'm a swimmer still. But I had to write to remember. A doctor in Oregon said, write things down and your memory will come back. Well, not only did that happen, I met young black writers literally doing word in a cafe next door to where we lived. And they were reading all the greats and, oh, that was never taught to me as being the last of the Jim Crow generation. So it blew my mind, but I didn't hear my voice, my Southern New Orleans neighborhood voice. And so I was mainly writing to remember and talking back to them. Mm -hmm. When I would hear something from Nikki Giovanni or Sonia Sanchez or Mary Baraka, who was then still Leroy Jones, I was writing back to them and writing my part of what I thought was missing. Mm -hmm. And it just took, and those young writers introduced me to their mentor who became my mentor. So I returned to college after my health was better finished and never looked back. So I was a poet in the schools, even as a younger undergrad. I interned in publishing at the University of Washington Press. 
I wrote for the, and I didn't write for them, but I did design, I guess, design assistance for the Seattle Post Intelligencer at the time, or was it the state side of one of the Seattle newspapers? But it was in the crossover from let it type mm -hmm. to computerized use of publishing. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of there at a unique crossroads, did community writers workshops. It was Black Arts West, Black writing in the neighborhood. And all of that fueled my development. And I, I had never looked back. It, I never did it to quote unquote become famous. <laughs> that was never in my purview. But I knew writers. My dad was a writer. He published a poem in World War II in the Army Journal. But that's not why he was a writer. He wrote eulogies for people who were literate and wrote the letters to their families when they needed to be contacted if someone passed away. Or he helped people write an application for a job. He helped my uncles get social security by filling out the forms and helping them write things. And so when I had the honor of caring for him the last decade and a half of his life, he said it was my turn. So I ended up doing that, writing the neighborhood eulogies and for people who needed that service. So he was always a writer. And he's the reason I own all these books because when I didn't know something, I had to look it up. So I'm nosy, I have an insatiable curiosity. I'm always learning, trying to learn something new. And it's his fault <laughs> and my papa's fault. So I'm thankful for that. So I have the oral and the academic. Mm -hmm. That's how I got to here. I just kept doing it. and. I loved that academics get summers off with pay and weekends and holidays, and they get to travel on somebody else's dime. So I saw my mentors doing all that, and I said, oh, we, this is not a bad life. And so I just kept working it and working it. And so I've worked at publishing companies and in small papers, as well as the Seattle one, but, and always just writing and researching and learning and, and educating. I've been an educator all that time. So it's been a great joy for me. Yeah. Your writing history is so beautiful, but I was curious about what does your writing process look like for you today? Do you have like any daily practices or um, things that inspire you daily? Or how do you, how do you write? as somebody who is balancing all of these different things? I am always moved by life, by the life I see, the life I hear about. I, it's such a precious thing. My elders always say every day is not promised. Mm -hmm. And so of course, during this pandemic time, we've buried far too many people in my community, of my church family, in the neighborhood and it just makes you embrace the little time we have. So I take notes all the time. Okay. I used to have a physical notebook. Now I do digital notes on my phone that become the genesis of something bigger. Mm -hmm. For instance, although at night I still have a notebook by my bed because mm -hmm. I turn off everything when I'm ready to sign off for the night. But if something comes to me, I, I make a note to myself physically, but, and I revisit those things and I polish those things and I teach a lot. Mm -hmm. So I have to make time and I do, I do. So now I'm completing another collection of poems. And soon as I knock that out, it's, it's pretty done, but I, I need to polish all of the poems and there are a few extra I want to get in there that are kind of not fully baked. And once I do that, I will return to essays on Black Creole culture. I want to produce a collection. And one of my former mentors told me there is no such book like the one I have mm. for both of them, because that's the wonderful thing. There's no competition. Mm -hmm. For every poet, you're talking about a different human being Nobody else walks in their shoes. Nobody else sees through their eyes. Nobody else hears what they hear. We could be at a party 
and there would be two dozen people there or maybe even six and people would have fun conversations or maybe not but each one of us would notice something different hear something different. some things we would hear similarly but most every individual brings themselves to their work to their lives and that's what you have to trust when you're writing and I think what guides me is the authentic about life that I try to capture because I'm trying to honor my ancestors, my community, my family. Mm -hmm. And if I am true to that, then if people like it, I am thrilled. And if they're not, well, it just wasn't for them. (laughs) And that has guided me safely. So I've never aspired to having this prize or that prize or something. But if God opens the door, I'm walking through. For example, I was nominated for this. This wasn't the first time, believe me. So there are many people qualified to do what I'm doing. But God said it was my turn. So I accept and I'm embracing it and trying to be all that is possible with that, Mm -hmm. which is how I live my life. (laughs) As you should, your voice is so uniquely New Orleans and your two books, Red Beans and Ricely Yours and Second Line Home are so inundated with New Orleans specific imagery and language. What about New Orleans inspires you and how does Creole culture slash Creole language influence your writing? All of the above. First of all, I was blessed to grow up happy. Mm. Poor. I didn't know what that meant. I had what I needed. There was a roof over my head. I never went hungry. I mean, there were summers when we ate mayonnaise on bread for lunch. And hey, I wasn't, I wasn't starving. We had a syrup sandwich and then graduated to peanut butter sometimes. (laughs) So I wasn't hungry. But we didn't have a lot, but we didn't care. We had each other and we had a lot of fun. There were public programs such as there was a swimming pool across the street and I'm an awarded medal swimmer. Matter of fact, I wanted to be the first black woman to get gold in the Olympics. Jim Crow said no, but that didn't stop me from enjoying swimming or anything else. And sewing my sister made all her clothes and oh my god she was a fashionista and I just like making things beautiful and so if I do a poem it's got to be beautiful it's got to be moving if it's not it's just ah. I and there are some people who carve beautiful poems but there's no feeling Mm. there's no and even if it's just a description some people know how to just carve a moment and so i i don't want to waste people's time reading my work if if i can't bring my best to it what's the point so all of that inspired my work and of course coming up we heard a lot of creole Mm -hmm. but and we were we were born and raised here but our parents wanted us to speak good english so they stopped teaching us the translations, although we still pick up words, mostly cuss words <laughs> and, and digs, but a lot of, a lot of mashuket gossip. So there are phrases more that I anchor and, and stories, lots of stories. So I'm not fluent in Creole by any means, but I speak more fluent French. I'm not fluent in French, but I speak a little French. Mm-hmm. And as you comply, I understand better than I speak because I don't use it every day. Mm-hmm. But all of that is part of who we are. It's our culture. And so the food ways, the masking traditions, mm-hmm. the all of that, the welcoming nature that mm-hmm. tourists say when they come to New Orleans, yes, it's the architecture. Yes, it's the music. And that's part of it, too. And all of those have African roots. All the food we eat is West African. If you go there, it's gumbo is the Bantu word for okra. Mm -hmm. So we, that's who we are. And that's what I try to capture. Because again, there was not a lot of that Mm -hmm. in the greater scheme of Black 
trying to add our little two cents <laughs> and make sure that we're in that number, as we say in New Orleans. Yes. You heard me? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I definitely did hear you. Uh, <laughs> so finally, how did you come up with the title Red Beans and Rice League Yours? That is a folk saying. Mm. And nobody owns it, contrary to popular opinion, because Louis Armstrong himself, the great Louis, used it to close his correspondence. And of course, he was world renowned and wrote to dignitaries all over the world, and some of which those letters were published. So people said, oh, he, no, he didn't. My grandparents say he did not invent that. It would be as though I said, I own way yet. Mm. It belongs to everyone. Yeah. So we have many terms of endearment with red beans. <laughs> so that's just one of them. And when he passed away, I said, okay, Louis, you've had it long enough. <laughs> so I started closing all my correspondence that way. And my family, the readers, my sister, my cousin Connie, and our partner, Onita, they read my manuscripts and Jeanette too. And I'll send them. And even Jane Turo voted on the last one. And that's AP Turo's daughter from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I would say, all right, here's the, here's the book. Here are the titles. You vote. Mm -hmm. And overwhelmingly, they said, this is you. This is you. This is what you all want. This is you. You took it back from Lewis. This is you. So that's what they do. And that's how it came. And I'm doing the same for this one. <laughs> because I, again, I want it representative. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you so much for your stories and your beautiful language and your work. And I had so much fun. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, I enjoyed you, Leah, and continued good fortune with your work. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Leah. And my name is Annie. And we work for the Poetry Matters Project. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check this poet out at the New Orleans Words and Music Festival this November 17th through 20th. This 20 year old festival is a virtual feast that spans five days, featuring entertainment and workshops for writers and readers of all talents. This year's keynote speaker, Clint Smith, will read from his New York Times best-selling novel, How the Word is Passed, and discuss with David Robinson Morris. For more information, visit the Words and Music Facebook page and check the Poetry Matters Project social media. We hope you have a happy and healthy day, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you, guys.